Welcome to day 12 of your 30-day dental MBA. Today we're going to talk about how to create a management information system. I know this is about the least exciting topic for any dentist, and I know this is true because people, you know, ever since about 300 BC when the Greeks, first Greek philosophers would say that people always want to seek pleasure and avoid pain, and I don't know what it is about dentists and computers and accountants and lawyers, but they repel from this. Like, uh, I mean, it's just unbelievable. I mean, I, I see dentist after dentist after dentist hasn't read a P&L or a cash flow statement or a statement of income. They pawn it all off on their wife and make their spouse do the whole thing. I'll go in there and say, well, you've had soft end. I think it's the greatest computer system there is out there. Uh, how many, which reports do you use? He goes, well, you know, I'm not sure I have my receptionist do that. Really? You think your receptionist has the incentives to want to run this thing like you should? Well, which reports do you use? Well, uh, I say, well, just name, name some reports. I mean, does, does it do five reports, 10, 100? I mean, it's amazing. This is the number one critical error. Now, if you're an athlete, you might not want to face a certain opponent. I mean, if you're the Phoenix Cardinals, I'm sure you never want to play half the teams out there in the NFL, but you have to. You have to confront these dragons. You have to slay the dragons and climb the mountains if you're ever going to be successful. If you're saying to yourself, I'm not going to slay the dragons, I'm not going to climb the mountains, I don't even know why you bought this thing in the first place. Just force yourself to get into this and do it. You know, we got um, a lot of older dentists who also think they're cute when they say, well, you know, I don't like computers. I, I, only, I, I only bought it when the girls promised I never had to do it. That, you know, that's, that's not cute. It's stupid, okay? You're 65 years old. You run a Fortune 500 company. I don't care if you graduated from college before they invented the computer. All successful people are, that are healthy, functional organisms are resistant to change, uh, are resilient to change. They move with, they go with the flow. I mean, if you've never done a computer in your life and you're 55 years old, you know how long it'll take you to learn Microsoft Word, Excel, PowerPoint, and your complete uh, management information software in your own office? Probably about a good 10 days. All it needs is this. If you think it's pain and you avoid it in fear, it's going to grow to be from being a little Doberman pincher in the corner. It's going to grow into be a big old Tyrannosaurus Rex. And it's going to bite you a lot. If I told you, if you climb that mountain over there, there's $100,000 cash at the top of it. You go skedaddle up that mountain right now. And you're leaving probably from the lifetime career of a doctor from about 25 to 65. The people who don't take complete control of their management information systems probably leave a million dollars of cash laying on the table at a minimum. I mean, think about it. 122,000 years, what the average dentist makes. Um, if you did that for 40 years, what's 122,000 times 40? It's a huge chunk of change. We'll go back and figure it out if it had been 192 times 40. Look how much difference that is. We're talking about big chunks of change. Now, I go into, um, when I'm dealing with dentists, and I, I get some really weird letters, uh, emails. I probably get 25 to 50 emails, letters, faxes, phone calls a day from dentists all over. And I have seen so many stressed out marriages because the dentist will sit there and they'll, they'll, maybe it'll be at a dinner the night before you go lecture somewhere and the dentist all of a sudden will start saying, well, I don't know what's wrong. I mean, you know, I do all the dentistry. I take care of my end, but you know, she doesn't take care of her end and, and she does the books and, and, and the woman's there stressed out. And this has been a very huge source of stress in their marriage. I've seen dentists pawning off the management of their dental office on their wife cause marriage after marriage after marriage to fail. I think it's a major source of dentist suicide, alcoholism, drug abuse, substance abuse, people. Name a Fortune 500 CEO where he could go to the board of directors and say, well, I don't know, I, I was just, I was doing my job. I was making the jet airline engines. It was the accountant who, uh, who screwed everything up and were not making money and he should have he told me something was wrong and he didn't tell me. You can't pawn off responsibility. There's not a CEO in the world who doesn't take 100% responsibility for all his successes and his failures based on what his team does. The buck stops here, okay? The buck stops here, you're the dentist, if you don't know how to run your dental office software, buddy, you got a bad attitude, you're dysfunctional, and don't you ever tell me that you're a dentist and you ever give your wife an ounce of stress about not running the business properly or doing the books or, well, she just does the books and I do the dentistry. That's a cop out. You got to be ashamed of yourself for even having a thought like that. You're the CEO. It's your name on the door. It's your name on the state board license. Your wife could divorce you and move to a different country and the state board. You got a problem with dentistry? They're still going to call you. 
You're not going to walk in and say, my wife, my children, my dental school instructor. The buck stops with you. You're the dentist. It's your office. You have to get control of your management information system. A strong management information system, and now the name's being changed. I think MIS is too long. A lot of people are calling it IT systems for integrated technology. Um, the main ones are SoftDent by um, Dentsply. That's John Miles out of uh, York, Pennsylvania. He's got about 12,000 users. Um, Dentrix is number two. They're owned by uh, Stan Bergman, uh, Henry Schein out of Maryville, New York. They got about 4,500 users. EagleSoft's probably number three. That's owned by Pete Frechette's Patterson out of Minneapolis, St. Paul. Uh, they got about 4,000 users there in Effingham, Illinois. Um, or Practice Outlook, which is um, right here in my own backyard. They got about, a, I think, about 11, 1,200 users. Uh, is the management information system or your IT technology is key to the renewal and productivity of the American Family Practice Dental Healthcare System. You got to get control of your books. Now, the first thing you might ask yourself is, how come 100 computer systems have come and gone, and then the three biggest companies in North American dentistry, you know, Dentsply, Patterson, and Shine, why do they all of a sudden get a piece of IT technology? Well, it comes back to a major question this earlier. Why did one out of every three Americans in the last five years have their bank bought, sold, or merged? What do you think was driving all these mergers? Um, it's actually it's the Y2K bug. About 1995, some of the premium accounts with gold visas and gold MasterCards and gold American Expresses, they started issuing these cards in 1995 that didn't expire until uh, January 15th, year 2000. And these premium, highly valued customers getting their credit cards, and they weren't working. And these banks are realizing, oh my gosh, it's our software. Um, it only has um, two places for the year, and the computer thinks zero zero is nineteen hundred. Well, you've heard about the year two K problem, long and gone, and and the big deal. But what it caused was this: if you're a dentist, you can go to the store and buy software to run a dental office. You can go to Patterson Shine. You can buy EagleSoft, Dentrix, um, Easy Dental, Practice Outlook, Soft, and you can you can buy them at the store. But if you're a bank, that software is proprietary. You can't go to some software shop and say, oh, by the way, I need uh, some uh, dental software to run Chase Manhattan Bank. Those are all proprietary systems. And in 1995, these banks are trying to figure out what it was going to take to reprogram all their stuff and get in programmers, and it's not their core competency, and there was no substitutes to buy in the marketplace. And finally, one by one, banks started raising their hands saying, excuse us, um, we're really screwed up. Would anybody like to buy us? And in the last five years, one out of every three Americans had their bank bought and sold simply because they had screwed up software. Well, let me tell you something. It's the same in dentistry. These guys all bought these systems because they know that there's about 40,000 dental offices using software that's not used by more than two or 300 dental offices. All these little nucleus of homegrown dental software made up in somebody's bathtub in their basement and none of it's Y2K compliant and they know that December 31st, uh, 1999, all, a lot of these systems are going to go dead and they're all going to have to belly up to the bar and plop down five grand for a new piece of software. And so just it was like um, buying a software company for these three big monsters in dentistry would be like shooting ducks running out of a barn on fire. I mean, it was a no-brainer. The easiest 35,000 cells you're already going to get. These companies already have you know anywhere from 700 to 800 sales reps in the field. Um, and they also want this managing information system because it's the future. Um, whoever controls the information superhighway will control the distribution. These software systems are going to be a conduit to your office to buy your supplies, to ask you questions. Um, um, you know how much easier it is for a dental assistant to be in the operatory and she realized she just ran out of emperor gum. And instead of waiting until the guy comes next Monday, she can just go right to her uh, software and she can click it in and go right into her sundries and say, I'm out of emperor gum before the sales rep even comes. And the order can be taken, it can be bought, they can deliver it. Um, it it's, it's the whole future. It's going to be the whole future of the dental office in the next zillion years is going to be based on your management information system. Um, we got some big banks out of it, and I'm glad because it's about time America gets a bank that uh, can loan a, um, that can get to a trillion dollars in capital. That way, every time a company needs money, they don't have to go public because Wall Street has a very short-term time horizon. You know, they want you to make a profit in three months. They're worried about this quarter, next quarter. When a, when a big, huge company can go to a bank and get a five-year loan, 
uh, they can start doing longer range planning. America never had the opportunity to have these big banks because of all the stifling regulation about interstate commerce and you couldn't have banks in other states and finally the uh, the Democrat socialist communists are getting repelled a little bit and they're deregulating airline industries, banking industries. So America is going to get bigger, faster and healthier um, and they need to if they're ever going to try to keep up with China. And uh, what you need to know on your management information system is you need to realize that this is the only leg of the stool. Remember he said economics is three legs of the stool. We make decisions based on the score we read and based on the incentives. Well, the management information system is the middle leg. It's the score. This is simply the score. The first thing we need to do is put pressure on. You need to call up and put a lot of pressure on Patterson and Shine and Densefly. Call up their head kahunas. Uh, um, call up Pete Frechetta Patterson. Call up Stan Bergman and Henry Shine. Call up John Miles of uh, Densefly. And because I'm telling this information and they're telling me, are you sure? I don't know if the dentist is really into that. They, a lot of these guys think that you're interested in more dental frills and thrills. But let me tell you something. It's the year 2000, and you got your accounting information on one system, like Quicken or Peachtree, or I like uh, Peachtree the most, or you might have it on Quicken or QuickBooks Pro, which is a little amateur, or you might have it on, on uh, Microsoft, um, which is real amateur. And then you got your dental insurance and billing and statement and schedule information on another computer. Well, that's, that's a design flaw from the word go. You sit there and look at McDonald's, 12,400 McDonald's. They went around a 31% food cost, 18% crew labor, 5% management fee, 12% uh, um, to the uh, franchise, which covers 5% for their uh, uh, rent, another 5% for um, royalty fees, I think 2% for their uh, uh, advertising campaign, yada, yada, yada. And that McDonald's wants a net somewhere around 18% net. And a $2,000 a month store manager, and a McDonald's has a million four hundred thousand a year. All these McDonald's are run to within a percent or two of their goal. Why? Because at the end of the day at McDonald's, they have one computer system. They load in all the information about how many hamburger patties they've left, how many cups they have left, all the data, all the change, and their management information system gives them one report that any $2,000 a month manager could read and understand what they're doing right, what they're doing wrong. I mean, their decisions are so easy to make because they're giving the score so easy to use. For instance, I go into a dental office and I ask a dentist, all, every team starts their day. I ask every dental office in the morning when they start their day, the first thing you gotta ask, what do we have to do today to enter the profit zone? Now we know in free enterprise, like when we're studying publicly traded companies and we study their 10Q quarterly reports filed with the SEC or their 10K annual reports filed yearly with the SEC, we know that in the Wall Street they talk about the trailing quarter or the trailing year or if you took off now, what would be their 12 month run rate? You know, what's a year from, from today forward a year? What are they running at now? What is the pace? I don't care if you're running two miles an hour uh, last week. How fast are you running today? Are you running four miles an hour? Are you doing 10 minute miles, nine minute miles, seven minute miles? We wanna know what your run rate is. Well, most dental offices have very predictable trailing quarters. For instance, the average dentist works Monday through Thursday. They work 16 days a month. The average dentist in the United States works like 16.1 days a month, okay? Well, I sit there and say, okay, well, let's look back to the three months, the last three months. Um, did you have the same number of hygienists the last three months? They laugh and say, of course we've had. And I say, the same number of assistants in the last three months? Yeah. Work the same number of days last quarter? Yeah. I mean, basically, you have your 16 days a month you work. And I say, okay, well, if you took your fixed cost, land, building, equipment, insurance, utilities, professional dues, continue ed, computers, tenant improvements, treatment rooms, marketing, maintenance, property taxes, and you divided that by 16 days, okay? That's your fixed cost. What do you have to do every day just for your fixed cost? And then to find out when you have profit, profit is only above your variable cost. Variable cost, which are labor, lab, and sundries, are your costs that go up or down directly proportional to the amount of activity going in your office. If you do twice as many crowns, your lab bills and sundries doubles, you need labor because you do the same number of crowns, you need the same staff, same chairs. So until you, until you, uh, you could look at your last month, your last three months in your own and say, okay, what is the average amount of total cost? What is the average total cost um, divided by the 16 days we're open? And you might sit there and say, wow, okay, divide out and I'll walk back and say, okay, this office has to do $2,000 a day, 16 days a month, $32,000 a month to pay all the bills, payroll, salary, everything. Do we got that? Do we understand that? And they go, okay, yeah, I understand that. Okay, that's the score. That's what your staff has to know. I walk in the staff meeting, I say to your receptionist, 
Uh, what, what, did, what did you do Saturday? You know, it's Monday morning. What, what did you do Saturday? She goes, I went bowling. I said, what do you bowl? She goes, oh, 167. Was it 367, 267, 67, or 167? No, it was a 167. I'll say to the assistant, what did you do? Oh, I went and played softball. What was the score? Oh, we won 3 to 2. Did you win 100 to 2 or 3 to 2? No, it was 3 to 2. I say to the hydrants, what did you do? Well, I went running. How far did you run? Three miles. Did you run two and a half miles or four miles? No, I ran three miles. I, I marked off. See, all humans know the score. Why? The score affects your behavior. Look at the Dallas Cowboys. In the 70s and 80s when I was growing up, look at the Dallas Cowboys. These guys were winners. Roger Stallback, some great players in there. And you would look at the Dallas Cowboys. What would happen when the Dallas Cowboys got to the two-minute warning and they were down by 14 points? You guys remember that? Cameraman just took a huge bong hit. The other one fell out of his chair. They come to the two-minute warning, and they're like, oh, my God, we're down two touchdowns. We only got two minutes to go. They totally regrouped. Tom Landry pulled inside and said, guys, look, you're, we're winners, okay? Um, we're, we're winners. We, we find it inside ourselves to win. And you know what? We've been running the ball for three and a half quarters, and every time we run the ball, we hit a wall. We've gained four yards in three quarters. I think we better change our behaviors because if we're going to be winners, we need 14 points in two minutes. So what do they do? They totally change their behavior. What do they do? They start throwing sideline passes and stepping out of bounds and stopping the clocks. And how many times did you see Dallas pull out two touchdowns and a field goal in two minutes? The score changed your behavior. Then I walk in your office the end of the day. The staff's all gone. I walk in there. There you are doing nitrous, popping Vicodin samples, you know, the, with a needle in your arm. And I'm like, uh, doctor, uh, did, you, did you have a stressful day? Uh, uh, what happened? He goes, oh, my receptionist, I, I, I want to kill her. Really? Why? He says, well, you know, we have to do $2,000 a day just to pay the bills. And we were at 1700 and we close at five, and at 3.45, one of my patients has been coming here for 10 years, call it the broken tooth, and you know what that bitch did? You know what she did? She scheduled her for tomorrow. I can't believe it. I lost $200 just for getting out of bed today. I think I'm going to fire her. And he fires his receptions every year. I mean, it's almost like every time the earth goes around sunny, he fires her again. And I said, I said, well, you know, that's terrible. I don't think you should fire her because if you fire her, she's going to go work for a dental office. She's going to infect that office. Give me an ice pick. I'll go up there and stick it right in her ear. And I walk up there, and I... I get up there and I get the ice picker and I say, hey, receptionist, what did we have to do today to enter the profit zone? She goes, what, what are you talking about? I said, well, you know, we, 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 you know we're, this has been the same office for last year. It's certainly been the same office for last quarter. Here's the profit and loss statements. I mean, this office takes $32,000 a month to pay all the bills. And we always, this office always usually works about 16 days a month. So $32,000 a month divided by 16 days. Um, it takes $2,000 a day to pay the bills. And what does she always say to me? Wow, I never knew that. No one's ever shown me the score. I mean, I mean, how long have you been working here? A year? And you've never seen a statement of income, a profit and loss, a P&L? No. Have you ever seen a statement of cash flow? Uh, Howard, I don't even know what a statement of cash flow is. Well, that's like your check register, you know. Um, deposits, cash, you know, write, checks, whatever. I said, what, what about the balance sheet? She goes, well, what balances? And I said, well, your, your assets balance with your liabilities, which what you owe, with the equity is what you own. You know, think of your house as the asset, and the liabilities, what you owe in your house, maybe 90 grand. The equity is what you've paid down, 10 grand. So your assets, 100,000, and that equals or balances with the 90,000 you owe on a liability with the 10,000 equity you got in. And she goes, wow, that's, that's interesting, Howard. Uh, no one's ever told me this. I, I don't even know who her accountant is. I think doctor's new wife does that. Uh, yeah, I think he's on his fourth wife now because the first three never got it down either. And it's a big source of stress in your marriage. Remember, what's the number one source of stress with all group practice breakups? Money. What's done with money, what they're buying, what they're not buying. One wants to buy intro cameras, one doesn't. One wants a dividend, one doesn't. One's lazy, one's not. Um, you know, they split the profit in half while one doctor's doing 60000 a month and one doctor's doing 20000 a month instead of doing wage-weighted profit sharing where you got $100,000 of profit for the year. And this guy did 40% of the dentistry, you should get forty grand. This guy did 60% of the dentistry, you should get sixty grand. You know, we wage rate all of our profit sharing. Whatever portion of profit we decide to do each month for profit sharing. I don't care if it's 10% of profit, 20% of profit. I don't care if it's half your gosh darn profit. It's, we say, okay, we're taking, say you say we're taking 10% of profit and we're going to do profit sharing. Well, if you take 10% of profit, it's 10,000 bucks and your payroll was 10,000 bucks. And for every dollar of payroll there is, 
there's a dollar of profit sharing. So if your paycheck was five hundred dollars for the month, you got five hundred dollars of profit sharing. If your paycheck was a thousand dollars, you got a thousand dollars of profit sharing. We want wage weighted profit sharing. And all these staff members say, God, I didn't know that. I said, Well, let's go back to yesterday. Okay, yesterday we were at 1850 at 330. We need 2,000 in the profit zone. Margaret called up with a broken teeth, needed a crown. How much is a crown? She says, 700. I said, well, what do you think should be done? Oh my gosh, we should have got it right down. Then we would have gone home. We would have won the game. We would have won the day. And I turned to the doctor. I said, why don't you show her this information? And he goes, well, that's, that's personal. No, you have low self-esteem and you're afraid to break down your eminence front and let people look into you and see that you're just a human. That's why you go up to everybody and say, I'm a doctor and you're not. But you know, you name a Fortune 500 company, I can tell you what every president of the company makes. Um, name an athlete. Um, do, do you know how much Michael Jordan makes? Do you think you can find out? Do you think everybody knows? I, do you know how much the President of the United States makes? The Senators, Congressmen, Governor? I mean, you can find out how much anybody makes. I mean, my gosh. In fact, you get on the internet, there are some wild websites for about four ninety nine a minute where if you sit there and type in a person's name and, and you keep putting in information, usually you can land their social security number, you land their social security number. Uh, I mean, it's amazing. It's frightening to me. The information you can find out someone if you go to some of these detective websites, I don't even say their names because it promotes paranoia. But the deal is you have to share the score with your staff. That's why I like um, that's why I like management information systems. I take them very seriously. I really, really, really like Softent, but I really think it doesn't matter um, any of the big three because when I go into uh, you know, I've seen about a hundred systems where maybe a hundred to three hundred dentists own it and usually it's non Y2K compliant. Usually they almost always, when you go meet the management system, when you go in there, it's some guy's garage or he's rent a thousand square foot and there's one programmer, one salesperson and a receptionist. I go into the big threes. I go into Eaglesoft by Patterson. I go into Dentrix, which is run by, uh, I just want to say Mel Gibson, but it's Larry Gibson. And you go into uh, um, Soft Dent and you, you um, go into those rooms. I mean, all of those companies, I mean, there are, I mean, it's a factory. I mean, they got like 30 programmers all banging at it. And if you look at structurally what the three big boys have, then you go into what all these little rinky dink ones have. I can make a pretty serious prediction that by 2005, 2010, it's going to be a three horse race. And the big boys, the three billion dollar players, Patterson, Shine, and Dent Supply are going to walk away with this deal. But what I want you to do is I want you to go back and put pressure on these companies to sit there and say, look, you got these big banks. These major banks, City Court Travelers, you got 780 billion. Bank of America and Nations Banks got 600 billion. Chase has got 400 billion. JP Morgan, 260 billion. First Union Money Store, 260 billion. Bank One and First Chicago, 220 bill. Wells Fargo Northwest combined, there they merged, they got 190 billion. These people have customers in all 50 states. We are approaching that by the year 2002, one of these big boys is going to have a trillion dollars in assets. Now, why? Then we get some scales of the economy. If we want to see dentistry go to the next level, we, we're still in the Henry Ford states. Henry Ford keeps going. You know, Henry Ford had 70% of the market. Okay. GM was facing bankruptcy. They were shutting down. They went to a billionaire named DuPont asking for a loan. DuPont said, I'll give you a loan if you fire the manager, because that's the reason you need a loan. Your current president sucks. If he didn't suck, you wouldn't be down here at the verge of bankruptcy. And replace him with that little boy over there named Alfred Sloan, who I personally think is pretty gosh darn smart. Um, Sam, can I get this coffee newt? So, uh, so what did he say? So, so, GM, so Sloan takes over GM. Ford has 70% of the market. Ford says you can have a car any color you want as long as it's black. It's $268. And uh, you had to give them all $268. A little man walks in there named Alfred Sloan, who will end up building the world's largest company, General Motors, 500,000 employees, the biggest corporation ever built in America. In fact, he designed the corporation. He was the one who designed it. He, he wrote the book on how to design corporations, kind of like how Alan F. Thornburg, AFCO in Atlanta, Georgia, wrote the book on practice mergers, buying, selling. That guy sold over a billion dollars in all practices. He walks out there and he says, well, he convinced DuPont of a couple things. He said, you know, Henry's kind of nuts. And DuPont says, Henry Ford, the billionaire, 70% all cars run by Henry Ford. Do you think this guy's nuts? Speak up. Why do you think he's nuts? And he says, do you really think every American wants to have the same black car? And it's $268. You know, I've been hearing some rumors. There's this company in Indiana that made a spark plug. And they named their company Delco. And they went up to Henry Ford and said, Henry, if you install this spark plug, 
you don't have to wind up the front of the car. And you know what Henry Ford said? Hey, you're trying to raise the price of my car. I've only got 70% of the market. How am I going to get the remaining 30% of the market if you're coming here trying to raise the price of my car? And he goes, wow, he thinks no one in America would want to buy a little upgrade on their car. And then he sits there and another, he says, doesn't he hear all these women complain and bitch about having to go up and wind up the front of a Model T car? And then this other guy in Detroit invented this way, you know, if you got a Model T, you get a flat tire, you can change the tire, but if you bend the wheel, the wheel didn't come off. And there's this company in Detroit and they come out with this removable wheel with these five lug nuts and they took it to Henry Ford. You know what Henry Ford said? He said, my God, what are you trying to do? Raise the price of my car? You're raising the price of my car. I've only got 70% of the market. How am I going to get the other 30% if you're raising the price of my car? Can you believe that? He thinks no one wants a removable wheel. But you know what's the wildest thing, Mr. DuPont? I mean, here he's up there in Detroit. It's 12 below zero. And the guy walks up to you and says, Henry, you're in Detroit. It's 12 below zero. Put a roof over the car. And you know what Henry said? My God, what are you going to do? Raise the price of my car? I've only got 70% of the market. How am I going to get the other 30% if you put a roof over the car and raise the price of my car? I can't raise the price of my car. I got to get the other 30%. I got to do it. I got to make these cars cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. And Henry Ford realized, uh, Henry Ford thought all people would go to one market and it was Alfred Sloan's genius insight of market segmentation. And he said, you know what the problem is with GM? He said, you have four, he said, you have Chevy, Pontiac, Olds, Buick, Cadillac, and I just assembled 10 of GM's top salesmen, and I sat there and I said, tell me the major unique selling proposition of each one of these cars. And you know what? Their own salesman couldn't even tell you really the major difference between the five cars. He goes, you have five cars competing with themselves. It's called cannibalism anywhere else. What we will do is we will do this. We will move the Chevy down here, and we'll run it straight against the Ford. And we'll move the Pontiac up. Instead of $268 for a Chevy, we'll add $100 onto the Pontiac. We'll charge $368, and we'll add the Velcro spark plug. And then we'll move this Oldsmobile up, and we'll add another $100, and we'll call that $468, and we'll put a roof over it. And we'll move the Buick over here, and it'll have removable wheels, and the Cadillac will have every damn thing in the world, and it'll be market segmentation. This was his complete unique genius idea. And he says, and you know how we're going to get him to come out with another $100? Henry wants all of his money up front. We'll finance it to them. We'll set up a separate division, GMAC Finance. We'll finance them with their own car. And, and then in order to buy these five companies, we'll have five independent companies all under one corporation. And then on top of that, this genius Alfred Sloan invents corporate law. He invents the corporate model. I mean, this guy, I mean, does he ever stop? Massachusetts Institute of Technology names their school of business after, after uh, Alfred Sloan, and when Alfred Sloan took over GM, Ford had 70% of the market. And when Alfred Sloan retired from GM, GM was three times larger than Ford. This guy is an American success story. And 99% of dentists in America can't even tell you who Alfred Sloan is. Why? Well, they couldn't tell you what it is because they're still back in the Model T cars. They're walking up to people and saying, it's a crown, it's $500, I need all my money now. And you've got $3 billion companies, Patterson, Shine, and Dent Supply. They've got complete management information systems in five to 10,000 offices. And now you finally have deregulated banks that now can have banks in all 50 states. So now we have all the ingredients where all they got to do is walk into someone like Citicorp and say, Citicorp, I got 11,000 dentists using soft debt. Why don't you wire into your deal so that when the new patient comes in, we can, uh, as we're entering their name and number and social security number, uh, on real time, on frame relay lines, on the internet, we'll sit there and while we enter the information, you'll do a credit check on them. And then while we're in the treatment plan, we've already entered the name, the social security number, the address, all the information you need for a credit check. And we just enter the treatment plan, then we're done. We'll hit enter and we'll hit financial arrangement and it'll pop out and say, okay, you owe us $1,600 a day for Root Canal Belt and Crown. Or if you take the one year financing plan, from Citicorp, uh, it'll be $100 a month. The two-year plan is $50 a month. Our 60-month plan is $20 a month or whatever. And until we bring installment credit to dentistry, which is what uh, um, Alfred Sloan brought to GM uh, before World War II, we are going to double the amount of sales in the dental once business. Remember, the insurance, which all the practice management speakers bitch about, they cover the needs-based. You know, I, I, hear, I hear cosmetic dentists bitching all day long that Delta doesn't cover bleaching and implants and veneers. I mean, people, we have an $8 trillion economy. 
What percent of it's controlled by insurance? 99% of the stuff you buy is not bought through some insurance deal. You bought your own house, you bought your own car, you went to Taco Bell, you went to the grocery store. We're not an insurance-driven society, but, but 80% of everything sold in the last five years, over $1,000 was financed, and dentistry to this day continues to walk up to people and ask for all the money down and they can't even figure out what uh, what Sloan used, that corporate strategy to slay GM 50 years ago. In fact, guess what? Henry Ford's dead and Alfred Sloan's dead. GM to this day is still bigger than Ford. I mean, they're bigger than Ford by $100 billion. That's when Alfred Sloan is so smart, he's still being Henry Ford from the grave. Because the men are dead, but their systems go on, their corporate strategy goes on. Ray Kroc, the founder of McDonald's, is dead, and every day 12,800 McDonald's get up and make a Big Mac with two LB pay, special sauce, cheese, less on a sesame bun. And I don't care if your native tongue is Japanese, French, Polish, English, Hispanic, Spanish, Portuguese, whatever. Systems live on. And what you leave behind you is what builds the wealth of a nation. When the kid's born today, he's already got world wars under his belt. He's already got dams, bridges, roads, vaccines, technologies, McDonald's, franchise systems. Building a wealth of a nation is building things that live past you so that the next generation gets that as a starting point. We're almost there, people. I think by 2002, if you call up these three major kingpin companies, Patterson, Shine, and Densply, put ungodly pressure on them to form a financial alliance with either Citicorp Travelers, Bank of America Nations, Chase, J.P. Morgan, First Union Money Store, Bank One Chicago, Wells Fargo Northwest. We're going to be there. But these three major companies say, well, Howard, I know you understand that. But, you know, you do $2.4 million a year. You got an MBA. I don't think the dentist is that sophisticated. I've got more faith in you than that. I know this is where you're ready. you got to give these big companies the market data research. If you're listening to this, call in and say, hey, have you listened to Howard's tape? I agree with them 100%. I want this financing option. In fact, I got some other rinky-dink computer software program. It's only part of it, like a 200 dentist on the system. I'll switch out. I'll go with your software tomorrow, and I want you to check off the little blank or whatever. Yeah, we got another dentist that wants to do this um, automatic in-office financing, and, and you could get these financing non-recourse to you, maybe give up as little as 4 to 8% of the, the uh, cost, depending on how long they were going to finance it for. People, this is a no-brainer. It's going to take dentistry to the next level. You're going to be doing more implant cases, veneer cases, bleaching cases, cosmetic cases, the want business of dentistry, where people don't pay based on price. They pay based on installment credit and their cash flow. If you say, I can give you all of this, and all you got to do is come out $50 a month, and they got $50 a month of discretionary income, free cash flow, they buy on. Okay, Alfred Sloan knew this. He raised and had 500,000 employees. I doubt he was wrong, okay? And that's the three legs of managerial economics. What's the reward? What's the score? Who makes what decisions? Successful companies who achieve goals support their employees with considerable training to improve efficiency from their high-cost labor investment. Invest massively in technology to get more outputs from their very expensive labor market inputs. Use gain-sharing systems, wage-weighted profit-sharing that spread the created wealth and share the reward. What motivates the owners also motivates the entire team. Have exquisitely crafted information management systems that assist in keeping the score. I have so many dentists say to me in such ignorant pig fashion, well, you know, I don't think, um, I don't think assistants really care about a 401k. I mean, I had one quit because she found a job that was five minutes closer from her home and it was 20 minutes to drive here and it's five minutes there. Well, buddy, it's called market differentiation. If you can't differentiate a job with you, good enough to have her drive 20 minutes in the morning as she took another job just because five minutes closer to her, hand, her home, that says more about you. Quit assuming that you're an elitist, smart person and that the nature of your beast is different than the nature of other people's beast. Everybody knows uh, that P that uh, companies like GM, once again, Alfred Stone's companies that offered pension plans, 401ks, profit sharing, they would get their employees to stay with them for 40 years just so they could retire with a pension at GM. Every human relations course I've ever took, every gosh darn, every course at Arizona State University or in the MBA program that I took on HR, they can show you so much reams of data says, oh yeah, 
You offer a 401k, people will be sitting there thinking, you know, I've had this job for 10 years, and I'm getting really frustrated. They've had a lot of changes, and I'm, I'm not really agreeing with where they're going now, but you know what? i got 10 years in this company. Um, I'm going to get a pension from this company. I know a guy, a friend of mine, my dad's brother, he changed jobs every five years his whole life, and guess what? He retired without a pension. And his other brother stayed with the post office for 40 years, retired with Social Security and a pension. And his brother worked with GM for 40 years, and he retired with Social Security, Medicaid, and a pension. And I've been here 10 years, they have a 401k, and I'm going to stick it out with this company because, you know, maybe it's, uh, maybe they're going the wrong way, but you know what, maybe changing jobs is kind of like deciding if you want your leg amputated above or below the knee. Either way, it's going to suck. I think I'll stay with this one above, uh, below the knee um, because it's got a 401k. Quit assuming your staff are going to act differently than the people who stuck it out with GM for 40 years. And remember, consulting evaluations show that overhead can be reduced by 5 to 10% merely through efficient protocol. Um, I have dentists say, call me all the time and say, do you really think it's worth 5000 or 10000 or 20000 or 30000 to have Kathy Jameson come to my office or Sally McKenzie or Linda Miles? Um, oh, there's just so many. I mean, how would you name them all? Um, there's so many consultants. Um, MTS Manji. You know, to come in my office to do this, I, and I say to them all the time, I say, do you really think Jennifer D. St. George, Linda Miles, Sally McKenzie, M.T. Asmanji, um, gosh darn, Bill Rossi, Dave Runkel, um, the Panky Institute, Mike Shee, I don't care who they are. You really think in a, in a world, in a little network as tight in dentistry where if you fart in California, um, you read about it in dentistry today in New York about an hour later, I mean, my gosh, you really think you could be in this business 10, 20, 30 years, charging dentists 5, 10, 20, 30 thousand dollars a year and be selling a bad product that no one benefited from? And the reason I didn't do an office consultation because what I could not eagerly handle is when you go tell a dentist what to do, he decides that about two thirds of it isn't true, so only does a third of it. Then he goes and tells his friends, well, I, I invested, I, I paid Dr. Brand 6,500 for one day, and it helped a little bit, but I didn't think it helped that much. And I'm just like, oh, I mean, I can't have that. I mean, I, I think consultants, um, you know, I always tell my, my friends out there, uh, Roger Levine and, and uh, Walter Haley, you, the, you guys have a whole different personality than I do because you can get in there and hold your hand and, and you can work with them. I don't have the personality for it. I mean, I want to walk in there. I want to punch these guys in the face about five times. I want to usually fire the dentist, free the staff, tell the, tell the wife that if she would just lock the dentist up in the basement every day and hire a 25-year-old associate that will do exactly what the office manager says, you're going to make so much damn money you can pay off the dentist just to stay home. And uh, they laugh, and, and it's, the dentist is my roadblock. He's a decision maker, and he's paralysis by analysis. Why did the average millionaire go bankrupt six times? Well, people say, well, what, what is, is he just gambling? No, he's making decisions. He makes a decision. It doesn't work. So he stands back up. He makes another decision. It doesn't work. Six decisions later, he's a millionaire. The problem with you is you can't make a decision. The first night I went out with my wife, you know, I always look at, at dating as an interview. I mean, I really want to be out with my five friends. You know, we had five guys in the house, living through dental school. I mean, it made Animal House look tame. I mean, it was a blast. You go on a date, why? Because, you know, you want to get married someday. And, uh, you know, you'd be asked these people questions. Usually within 30 minutes of date, I was thinking to myself, there is no way in the world I would, date, I would marry this woman. I'd rather put a gun to my head. And I'd use it and say, you know, uh, maybe an, I could get out of this thing in an hour, two hours. My wife picked her up between junior and senior year. I had to get a date to the uh, University of Missouri, Kansas City uh, uh, prom deal, and it was called the Bushwhacker Ball. You know how hard it is for a bald dentist to get a date to the Bushwhacker Ball at the god dang dental school? I think it had been easier to just go smuggling a, a nuclear bomb from Iran. And uh, so I got this date, picked her up, talking to her, everything's going great, 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 great. And I, just, I couldn't get over it. I mean, everything was right. Her dad owned her own business, free enterprise, everything's smart, had the same values, conservative, everything was right. And I just kept asking her question after question after question. We, we left the dance about an hour, kept asking her question. Finally, at 2.30 in the morning, and about a thousand questions later, I said, my God, it'll never be better than this. I asked her, you marry me? She thought I was nuts. Second Friday night, I picked her up and I said, you know, you know uh, have you thought about getting married? And she's like laughing. She's like, what are you, crazy? Finally, about the sixth date, I show up, plane tickets, round trip plane tickets to Las Vegas, and she throws them back at me. I give them to her again the eighth date. She calls me up the Friday of the 10th Friday date. I'm in the clinic. I'm doing a filling. Uh, Bob Rui, my roommate, is assisting me. Um, they page me. Rui gets the phone. He says, it's that girl uh, you've been dating. I get the phone. She's a broker or calling me from Merle Lynch. She says, um, are you really serious? 
I said, what do you mean am I serious? It's all I said, all I bought you the plane tickets, you got a round trip tape, body, 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 body. And she goes, but you don't even have a ring. And I said, shit, forgot. I said, well, man, I'm booked. I got a root canal this afternoon. I get out of here at five. The plane leaves at seven. I, I'm sorry, I don't have time to go to ring. And she goes, well, um, she goes, I don't know why I'm doing this, but she goes, I'll take off my lunch hour. I'll go get two rings. I've only got 400 bucks. She bought these two $200 bands and I'll pick you up. But are you sure? Are you sure this is right? I mean, 10 weeks, what's the deal? I mean, the deal is I can make a damn decision. Took me 10, took me about four hours to realize this is my wife. Made a decision, 10 weeks married. We've been married 12 years. We have four kids to show. I know dentists have been dating women for six years. What the hell are you asking six years later? It's called shit or get off the pot. Make a decision. The average millionaire went bankrupt six times because they make decisions. And when they make a decision, they flip a switch and it shocks them and throws them back down. They get right back up, think harder. They flip another switch. It shocks them, throws them back down. They jump right back up. They think even harder. Six bankruptcies later, they're a millionaire. It's not gambling. It's decision making. You know what you need to do. The word decision comes from the word decisive. It's Latin. It comes from the word meaning cut off. Cut off from what you're doing now and make a decision. A decision is change. Take a new direction. Try it again. It, by mid by the mid 80s, information technology had reached critical math, both in installed base and organizing organizational learning. We know in the 1960s, computer era, IBM took off with the DP era, data processing era. By 1975, it was called the micro era, where you had all these little mini mainframes, uh, um, and it was called the micro era. By 1995, Bill Gates is the richest man in the world. He's worth $100 billion and it's a network area. What you need to do, don't fight Bill Gates. You know, the, people say he's a monopoly. L we'll look up an economic theory. What the hell is a monopoly? A monopoly is anybody that makes extraordinary profits and has, instead of diminishing returns to scale of profit, has increasing returns to scale of profit. It means the more units he sells, the more the profit margin goes up. Well, let me tell you something. If he has, if he has extraordinary profits, which he does, and if he has increasing returns to scale of profit, which he does instead of diminishing returns, don't sit there and whine to the federal government, buy his damn stock. Whenever the damn newspaper starts saying someone's a monopoly, all they're saying is, hey, numb nuts, quit buying four wheel drives, jet skis, quit eating out, buy this stock. He's making extraordinary profits. He's making increasing returns to scale of profit. The more they yell monopoly, the more I'm like, you're right, you're right, you're right. I need to buy more stock in Microsoft. I mean, my gosh, you should hope for monopolies. What I need is about three good monopolies that do an IPO today and ride out a ride for about 40 years. If you could tell me which three monopolies are doing an initial public offering today and they'll have about a 30 year stock run, um, hell, I'd, I'd sell the farm today and buy in. Don't fight monopolies, buy with them. I mean, I mean, you had, you had um, Apple, who thinks fear and scarcity and they wouldn't let anybody have their operating system. They wouldn't let anybody make their computers. They, they had to do everything themselves and they shrunk all the way to 3% of the market. Bill Gates got a monopoly because he's thinking abundancy. Let's grow the market. It's called network. It's called NT 4.0. It's called Microsoft Word. If it's not a Microsoft product, I don't want it. You know why? Because any other product you buy, if Bill Gates is going to go up against it, who do you think is going to win? Well, let's see. Uh, Bill Gates is a Harvard graduate. He's the richest man in the world. He has a hundred billion in cash and he's going after the product that you're into and you're 40 years old and you're going to be in dentistry 25 more years. What do you think is going to happen to your investment? You know, why don't you go to Africa and charge a rhinoceros, okay? Don't piss in the wind. Go with the flow. And I'll tell you what, everybody that makes fun of Microsoft, this is what I think they were missing the point on. You go back in the 60s, everybody had a computer, no one talked to each other. You know, he had all these different systems and Microsoft and, and Unix systems and all these different systems. And you know how much productivity that cost America? You know how nice it is that today that, you know, you sit there and you want to uh, email someone a file and they're on Microsoft too, or you download on a floppy or a zip drive and you take it over there and they're on the same system. I mean, what would happen if everybody in the world was on a different operating system? I'll tell you what, when the government monopolizes roads, bridges, utilities, they think that's fine. Well, if you were going to monopolize everything, monopolies is basically called creating standards, okay? Standards build the wealth of nation. You know, when they started laying down electricity, if the federal government said, look, we're not going to have a thousand different utility plants making electricity in different lengths and, and wavelengths and all that, everybody, here's the deal. It's either 110 or 220. Well, by creating a standard, 
you allow for massification, products get cheaper. Creating standards builds the wealth of a nation. Every time a country creates a standard, everything becomes more efficient. It breaks down barriers. Don't fight Microsoft, just jump on it and go. The three major errors of humanity that drastically increase the standard of living are all based on knowledge over time. And the first massive increase in the standard of living humanity came when they started having increasing uh, technology and agriculture. When they went from being nomads to uh, farming. And, and as they discovered, you know, an oxen plow. And an oxen plow is just a castrated bull who pulls a plow all day. Then the next massive increase in standard living was the Industrial Revolution, where we started to harness other forms of energy. And the Industrial Revolution was the standards revolution, because the, the, why the Industrial Revolution raised the wealth of a nation is before everybody made something by hand. So every railroad track you bought, or every, uh, every hammer you bought, or every silverware you bought, every one of them was made differently, none of them were uniform. But when you start using machines to make machines stamp out things, they stamped every one of them out the same. And then they started becoming interchangeable. That set it up for assembly line production, where every part would fit in the same hole, because all the parts were made by the same machine, all the holes were drilled by the same machine. That built the, the, the wealth of nation. And now we're in wave three, and that's the information age. You know, you go back to 1900, 1% of Americans graduated from college, they were wealthy elitists. All the peasants couldn't read or write. Now, uh, 1960, 40%, 1950, 40% of Americans graduated with a high school, to, or had a high school diploma um, or less. And in 1998, it was 80%. In fact, now 40% of Americans have a college degree. So now at the year 2000, the same percentage of Americans have a college degree that at World War II had a high school education. So we are massively in the information age. And how can your dental office be in the information age if your payables and receivables aren't even connected to your damn dental billing statements machine. We gotta put these two together, get it on one system, one standard, and link that up with these big banks. That's our financing error, and we're gonna get incredibly wealthy. In 1962, for the amount of power you would buy on a computer today for a penny, in 1962, the year I was born, would be $10 million. That's how much faster and how much power computers are come. You know, W. Edwards Deming was the American physicist from MIT. Um, he always said, in God we trust, all others must use data. He was the genius from MIT who had to go to Japan after World War II because Japan was demoralized. They lost a world war. They had two cities nuked. And of course, in the American way, we had nothing against the people of Japan. We had nothing against the people of Germany. We had to shut down the Nazi government. We had to shut down Imperial Japan. And like good American style, when we're done, we rebuild them. And the military sent over um, Douglas MacArthur, and he said, rebuild Japan. He did some little studying, finding. He says, well, who's, who's the smartest consultants in the world? And MIT said, you know, you got to listen to this guy, Deming. Deming went over to Japan, and he set these guys how to use data. And I don't want to go into uh, statistical quality control, because I don't really think it, so much it, it's, it's too anal, it's too much detail, it's hard to get into. All I want to say is that the, the major thing that, data, that Deming did was saying, look, Economic theory. These guys have to know the score. People, the score, it's either 12 to 11 and you won, or it's 10 to 11 and you lost. You have to know, is it 10 is 11? Are you getting 1% better every year? Are you getting 1%? Yes. You have to know data. In God, you trust. All others use data. Dennis always tell me, though, I say, well, you know what? I'm, I think I'm going to cancel my yellow page ad. I'll say, why is that? No, oh, I don't think it's doing anything. I said, well, how many patients did it refer last month? Oh, I don't know. Well, if those patients referred, how, how much dentistry did it do? Oh, I don't know. Well, how much did the ad cost? I think it's like, I think it's like 1,600 bucks. So why do you want to cancel it? Well, 1,600 bucks is a lot of money. I said, but how many patients did it refer last year? Oh, I don't know. And that's why I tell Fred Joel. I mean, I love Fred Joel death. He owns 1-800 dentists. I mean, you know what's funny is you go into 1-800 dentists, 90% of their customers have never stopped being with them. I mean, hell, I've been with them since 89 and, uh, you know, in, in, in most parts of California where he started in L.A., uh, I, I know a very good friend of mine, Mike Detola. Mike Detola's a good buddy of mine. If you haven't heard Mike Detola speak, get run tomorrow and go listen to him. Detola was on a waiting list for five years. He, in fact, to this day, he still doesn't have it. 
Well, you think, well, if it's so bad, why didn't everybody just cancel? I mean, why would you want to pay $1,500 a month for something that just sucks so bad? Well, the deal is that, that these people that have data, they sit there and say, well, God, 1-800-DENTIST is $1,500 a month. It refers to me 15 new patients a month, so that's $100 a head. Uh, the average patient came in, did $800. Subtract out your fixed costs, your variable costs, yada, yada, yada. They figure out the return on their investment. So I go, well, numb nuts. Well, you're canceling your yellow page ad, or you're canceling 1-800-DENTIST. You don't even know how many patients are referred. You don't even know how much dentistry those patients did. What is this based on? Well, I just got a gut feeling it doesn't work. I said, I dissected about seven people in dental school, and I, I remember guts. They're filled with fecal matter. What you're telling me is you've got a shitty opinion. You don't know your ass from second base. Get data, okay? Don't go with gut feelings. You're not John Wayne, okay? You're, you're a businessman. Um, the guys that run the Fortune 500 companies don't want to hear a bunch of vice presidents sitting around a table um, belching out what they think or war stories or their last fishing trip or, or their last poker game. They want reports, data. And in fact, they have management information, IT executives now on a board level. Um, it used to be that in the olden days, the IT director would report to the, uh, the chief financial officer. The problem with that is all the data collected was for the chief financial officer. And the marketing department was saying, look, you, you're, you're not collecting data for us. I mean, you don't tell me how many uh, uh, patients were referred from all these different people. We don't have the data for feedback for marketing. And then other people sit there and say, what about quality control? You're not entering the data about the return rate, which ones, yada, yada, yada. And the sharpest CEOs, the sharpest ones with foresight on this were about 1970s. And you go back in, in the whole decade of the 70s. From 1970 to 1980, the Fortune 500, only about 15 Fortune 500 companies were smart enough that the CEO realized what Deming said, that data, it's all statistical quality control, um, you need to know the numbers. And they moved the IT director from reporting to the CFO to a board level position equivalent to the CFO or the vice president or the vice president of marketing or the vice president of operations. And those dozen or so companies that moved the IT director to a board level company but in the, the decade of the 70 to the 80, from 80 to 90, those companies grew at about twice the rate as the rest of the Fortune 500 aggregate. Um, I mean, it's just incredible what this does. And what we still got, we got dentists after dentists after dentists. They can't do Microsoft Word. They can't do Microsoft Excel. They can't do Microsoft PowerPoint. Um, hell, you can do Microsoft Publisher Layout, and you can build a newsletter to mail it to your patient in about five minutes. Um, gosh darn soft dent. Print out the labels. Print out this. Email among all my employees. I'm at home. It's 1.30 in the morning. I just got home from a plane flight. I've been reading a book. I'm all fired up. I got a message. I got to tell my staff. And I'm sitting there at home. I go log on because my computer at home is connected to my computer at the dental office with a $99 a month uh, frame relay line. I log on to my computer and it's like I'm in my uh, private office. And I sit there and I type out this, you know, uh, maybe one page email, memo, whatever, and email it to all my staff. And you're sitting there at the year 2000, new millennium, the 21st century, you don't even have an email? I mean, you need to be networked. And then we'll bring in financing. This, this is the state of the art. A computer allows you to make more mistakes faster than any other invention except for handguns and whiskey. So watch yourself. Uh, uh, I had another day, uh, some of you Fran Report subscribers probably know this one. Uh, I had a, uh, my little Sheila May, my little 45-year-old redhead that uh, reception is at the uh, Ferrand Report, who a lot of you already know very well. Uh, she was playing around with the computer terminal, hit a wrong button, <laughs> it rebuilt every mass charger visa that she had taken for an order for the last year in like six seconds. And it took her about a, took her about a day to undo that mistake. We always laugh about that one. That, uh, but um, not very many dentists thought it was funny. But uh, dentists with computers in their primary practice in 1984, only 11% of dentists had a computer in their primary practice. Today, 1994, it is 66.8%. Can you imagine? Name anything else in dentistry that from 84 to 94 went from 11 to 66%. Hell, intraoral cameras in the same time period went from about 1 to 40%. Uh, lasers went from about 1 to 5%. Computers went from 11 to 66 uh, percent. Michael Gerber wrote a book called The E-Myth, which everybody has to read. It's why are over 90 percent of all franchises still in business in 10 years because they're process systems driven, while mom and pop, the average mom and pop business closed in 10 years because they're so wrapped up in their product. 
They're so wrapped up in making their film or their root canal or their promo tape or their wheat farm. They're so caught up into the pig farm, the dairy farm, that they don't even know the math. They don't even know their cash flow. And you deal with these companies, and some of them are erratic. Um, you know, you incur $10,000 of uh, business with them, you don't need, and it's three months later, you haven't got a bill for it yet. You're like, Jiminy Christmas, what is their account receivables like? The might of your brand name, the attributes of your services, and the strength of your distribution systems gives you an enormous competitive advantage setting up a protective moat around your economic castle. That's what Warren has to say about this stuff. You can't steal creativity. One can steal, all one can steal is a product, a byproduct of creativeness or of good management policy. One cannot steal the creativeness or the good management policy. That's what Abraham Maslow said on his greatest book he ever wrote was Maslow on Management. The top 10 restaurant chains are all linked to a headquarter. Every one of these restaurant chains downloads all their data every night. In fact, if there's any publicly traded dental companies out there listening, and I've gone to several, uh, two or three of my board meetings and things like that, um, Softdent has a super deluxe system called the Softdent Enterprise. These, this is a $100,000 system. This is for the big people. And I'm telling you, if you're running you know, five or six offices, or you got three or four offices, or let alone you're uh, a big person with, you know, maybe 40, 50, 100, 200 offices, um, you really ought to look at these big, powerful systems. Each day, 7% of all Americans eat at McDonald's. Worldwide, they have nearly 20,000 stores with average 95 revenues of 1.8 million each, and they only have 55 items on the menu. McDonald's has 332 service auditors for 11,400 stores in the United States. You know what that means? That means that they are so systems driven that they only have one auditor for every 34 stores. If you had 34 dental offices just like you, you'd need a legion of people that sit there and get under control and it'd be an absolute chaos. That is how systems dependent McDonald's is. One auditor for every 34 stores. Franchises that's why franchises are now 40% of retail sales. There's now 540,000 franchise units in America. And let, let me show you some of these reports where um, um, the importance of some of these reports is to start turning on, seducing you to what a management information system can do. And this report here is basically, um, um, you know, soft for Windows uses account information to maintain billing and insurance data. Um, transactions are posted by individual. Billing is calculated by account. On the guarantor one screen, the name, address, and personal information for the account guarantor is entered. Uh, the guarantor number two screen is exactly the same as the guarantor number one screen. Um, you know, just things like this that you need to use. Um, slide, this slide here. Um, yeah, um, this is um, basically your month, laser monthly statement. You have several options for printing the laser monthly statement. If you print from the accounting reports menu, your options include monthly, rerun today's, run batch, batch count. You can also print from the account options menu. You sit there on this slide here, uh, allows for a flexible memo system that is fully integrated with the contact database, allowing you to enter reminders about pending contacts with patients, insurance companies. Reminder memos are also a convenient means of inner office communication, personal reminders. When you enter a reminder memo, you specify when the, remind, when the reminder first appears in your system and how often it displays thereafter. After you start the program and enter your password, SoftDent for Windows checks to see if any memos are scheduled to appear on the current system data. There's so many things this thing, you could never, you could never, in a year after getting SoftDent, you could never ever utilize everything it does. Um, this one, this report here, the in-office feature tracks patients from the time they arrive in your office until they check out. Remember, Southwest Airlines has the on-time delivery stuff. It tells you which patients are scheduled for the day, their appointment times, the provider, the operatory for the appointment, the first procedure to be performed. Options on the screen let you track patients' arrival times or location. Are they waiting in the room? Are they waiting in the operatory? The time spent in the operatory? I mean, it just galls me that I can do all these stuff on soft and it doesn't even, it's not even licked up to a big trillion dollar bank. And this one here, the um, electronic router screen displays a patient's personal and financial information, as well as information that typically appears on printed routing slips. If your practice has operatory terminals, the electronic router screen can eliminate the need for paper routing slips. From this screen, you can set up or schedule treatment plan procedures, follow-up appointments, even create a history file. This screen right here, this one, uh, this report, 
The first section of this, of this screen displays the patient's name, address, phone numbers, referral information, next exam due date, last exam due, user codes, recall information. The second section lists details on the patient's scheduled appointments. The third section lists any notes and medical alerts specified for the highlighted appointment. Options for this screen include auto schedule, let you specify when and where to search for available appointment. Um, instant recall, this option takes into account the length of the appointment, provide hours. Go to recall day, access the daily appointment screen for the day that is specified, number of months after the patient's last exams. Make referral for making an outbound referral for this patient, print reminder cards. I mean, this thing does everything but scratch your back. Um, this report here, the daily appointment screen is used to schedule appointments for up to 24 month period. The current month, two previous months, and 21 months in advance, the screen is often referred to as the day book. Uh, the appointment time units appear on the left of the screen. Soft dent for windows divided the hours into 10 or 15 minute intervals, depending on how you set up your schedule when installing the program. The scheduled field displays the fee total, less any estimated write-off amounts for PPOs, discounts, for the procedure schedule for that day for all operatories. What did I just say? That means they look at the schedule, they know what they have to do to enter the profit zone, they open up the schedule at seven o'clock, they know if they're near or not. Today's dental does 10,000 a day. We open up at seven o'clock and at 15 till seven, every one of my staff knows what we got scheduled and they walk in there and they say, uh oh, we have $9,200 on the books. We better get in, a, if someone calls out an emergency, we're seeing them. I don't care if you miss your lunch hour, we stay here an hour late, we're not doing a day for under 10 grand. And, and this, and I, how would you do this without soft dent? Whenever you schedule or cancel an appointment, soft dent for Windows automatically adjusts the total. The schedule field will only display for users who have the necessary security levels. Uh, this screen right here, uh, by default, the daily appointment screen displays appointments for three operatories. By using the expanded view, you can view up to seven operatories at a time. Um, you can mark the smart daily appointment book in expanded mode field on the schedule settings windows to have the day book automatically display with seven operatories rather than three. I personally would say get it to eight since I have eight, but uh, that's just whining. And this one here is the outstanding claims window showing the claim numbered, covered patient name and ID, date range for transaction submit on the claim, total charges, estimated and actual insurance payments, and whether the claim is for a treatment plan procedure requiring pre-authorization. The neatest thing about this is that every time the insurance pays, it updates what this insurance pays so that the next time someone comes in with that insurance and you do and you're saying, well, we want to estimate your copayment, the computer estimates it based on how these people have been paying in the past. I mean, it's absolutely genius. This is why this system's in 12,000 dental offices. Um, this um, sh um, screen here, the insurance claim screen contains information that transferred directly to the insurance claim form. It appears when you submit or verify claim information. In the screen's common area, soft dent for windows will assign a claim ID number, fill in the patient name and ID, annotate the inclusive dates of procedures claimed, identify the billing doctor, the service provider, um, everything you can think of. I mean, these guys think everything and more. Um, here's one soft dent for windows uh, lab case tracking feature. Not only tracks statistics for each lab used by your practice, but also helps you avoid scheduling resource conflicts resulting from unreturned lab cases. Man, you can find out in addition to storing lab information, soft dent for windows prompts you to add a lab case when appropriate and reminds you when an existing lab case has not been returned. By entering and maintaining lab case data, you want to worry about bringing a patient back into the office before their lab work is done. And you also know what your remakes are, which ones you're sending back. They thought of everything, people. This screen here, soft dent for windows, allows you to create and schedule multiple treatment plans. These plans can be organized into different treatment groups, making pre-authorization and scheduling easier. For insured patients, a plan shows the expected insurance and patient copayment amounts. Treatment plans have no effect on patient account and insurance balances. Soft Dent for Windows treatment planning feature ensures that all planned treatments receive follow-up attention. This one here, um, this one here, um, you can establish patient budget plans for any procedure, including orthodontic procedures, um, insurance tracking features for ortho. This feature makes it easy to resubmit orthodontic claims on a regular basis without making them complete until final case. Because remember, you do ortho. Um, when you do a $4,000 ortho case, you're only going to incur your cost 15 minutes a month for the next, gosh darn, 24 months. You don't add $4,000 to your account receivables because you haven't incurred the cost of doing the ortho yet. This one here is um, 
Another one of my favorites, this is a soft dent for Windows referral system. Allows you to track all doctor referrals to and from your practice. You can keep a record of which patients have re been referred to an outside provider, which outside providers have referred their patients to you. You can So you can track if this is a two-way street, is a value added, or is it just some oral surgeon that thinks the only thing this ape's got is a pair of wisdom teeth, and as soon as he hacks them out, he never sees him again and thinks there's no value in this patient. Um, this one here, is, uh, I don't know how we'd live without this one. This is a killer. Softense Electronic Claim Submission provides access to over 100 insurance companies representing thousands of plans nationwide. This service utilizes the nation's largest electronic um, healthcare network, NEIC, to deliver electronic claims directly to the insurance company's computer system. The service also provides additional access to payers through Envoy Corporation's web network of direct carriers. Softent for Windows. Um, electronic claim system is fully integrated with your soft dent dental management system. All you have to do is identify those companies that accept claims electronis, electronically. When you post procedures to an insured patient for one of these plans, the electronic claim system module does the rest. Claim submission is accomplished at your convenience. It doesn't interfere with your daily office routine. You simply press a key and soft dent extracts all the claims that are ready to be submitted validates them and sends them on their way in a matter of minutes. In fact, we send out the insurance after each patient. We send it out as we check out the patient. We don't sit there and wait till Friday to do insurance. We send it out one by one. The on-site validation process significantly reduces the number of rejections and requests for additional information. Softense electronic claim system has an 800 number for both transmission and support. The software provides complete reports on the validation of claims information. It does everything, people. Uh, this one here, um, this one here is uh, for many offices, generating a soft dent for Windows report is only the first step in patient management. After running an account aging report, for example, a staff person usually needs to call those patients with overdue balances or send an appropriate letter. This contact processor organizes these report generating names on a list so you won't, won't overlook a patient and record the details of any attempted or successful contact. You can even leave a list and return to it later. In addition to functioning as another output device like a printer, the contact processor also tracks the number of calls to be made, the number of completed calls, the average length per call, the estimated time to complete all the calls. Hell, it'll even dial a damn phone number for you. I, I, and on and on, it has a hygiene analysis report. This report compares the hygienist's scheduled hours to the available hours, analyzing the use of the hygienist's time. The report generates information for one or all hygienists for the previous and next 12 months based on recall codes, the actual information. And this is the one I use to find out if it's time to raise my hygiene fee. And this last one, the practice Braun reports, compares practice totals for two time periods. It compares patient numbers, active, inactive, seen and new, production, collection, goals. In addition, it calculates the percent of change between these two periods. People get a management information system. Um, get it today, get it, learn it, use it, implement it. Thank you very much.